I wanted to bring a little bit of a, a view of the localization movement um, from, the, from the U.S. Um, to this conversation today. Um, and I want to start by noting that the U.S. is home right now to hundreds of thousands of local enterprises. And then in recent years, local enterprises, at least in some sectors of the economy and in some regions of the country, have been growing, both in popularity um, and in some cases in numbers. The U.S. is home to about 15,000 small locally owned banks and credit unions. Last fall, 600,000 people in the U.S., citing the concerns raised by the Occupy movement, moved their accounts from big banks to local banks and credit unions. Since 2002, we've added over 110,000 small farms in the U.S., uh, according to the U.S. Census. Phil McKibben mentioned that last night. The number of farmers markets in this country has doubled from about 3,000 10 years ago to 6,000 today. And independent retailers are beginning to make a bit of a comeback, excuse me, at least in, uh, at least in some sectors. Um, which is really crucial because in a lot of cases, the local retailers are the point of interaction between our households and the rest of the productive economy. And the more local retailers we have, the more opportunities there are for local producers, right, to get their goods out into the world. Um, in my neighborhood a few years ago, I live in Portland, Maine, um, and we had a, a, a neighborhood grocery store open up about three years ago. It's this little small store uh, down the street from me. And they showcase, they sell all of these local um, foods, not only locally grown foods, but locally made yogurt. And there are people in my uh, state, apparently, who make tofu and all these different things, locally grows, grown meat and cheese. And it's just packed. I mean, if you go in there at like 5 o'clock, you kind of have to turn sideways to like slide down the little aisles of this store. It's not alone. Um, according to the census, uh, uh, the most recent economic census, since 2002, the number of small neighborhood grocers and specialty food stores has grown by more than 1,400 across the country. Some 476 new independent bookstores have opened in the U.S. since 2005, believe it or not. Some uh, have been financed by their neighborhoods, like the Greenlight Bookstore in Brooklyn, um, which opened right at the worst moment uh, of after the financial crisis, you know, couldn't get a loan from the bank and ended up raising money in all of these small loans from people in the neighborhood to open that store, and they're doing fantastically well today. Um, the census also shows that uh, sewing shops and fabric stores are on the rise, and of course we have more and more local uh, designers and clothing producers, more independent retailers selling locally made clothing. Uh, over 150 communities across the country have uh, said no to the Time Warner monopolies on cable and Verizon monopolies and built their own publicly owned fiber and cable networks. And they do their own television, telephone, internet, uh, all publicly owned by the community. And I wanted to mention some of these, and there, there are a lot of other statistics I could give you, but I wanted to mention these things for, for a couple of reasons. One is that we're not starting from scratch in terms of building a new economy. There's a foundation out there to work with. But more important than that, I think even, is that all of these local enterprises, all of these small business owners, they represent a constituency, a political constituency, that we really need to bring about the kind of change in public policy that we need to see. A potential constituency, at any rate. We still have a lot of work doing to organize them. So in sharing um, these, I think, encouraging uh, signs of, of change that are out there, I want to be really careful um, not to gloss over the very intense challenges that local enterprises uh, have been facing. Um, the last few decades have obviously been very tough uh, for independent businesses of all kinds and small farmers. Uh, many small businesses have fallen by the wayside as large corporations have gobbled up one sector after the uh, one sector after another in the economy. Often, of course, aided by government subsidies and policies that tilt the playing field. You know, and, and we can see this um, all over the place. You know, the food system is a great example. You all, I know, are aware of what our, our farm bill does in terms of what it funds and what it doesn't fund, uh, and how it supports the industrial agriculture system. You know what is happening in, in the food system is actually very similar to what's happening in a lot of sectors of our economy, 
Right now we have this growth of all this small local stuff going on on the one side, but then the rest of the system is actually simultaneously becoming more and more consolidated and industrialized. In food, for example, we now have a situation where we have 300 million eaters on the one side, about 2 million or so farmers on the other side, and it's shaped like an hourglass. And in the middle are a handful, a very small handful of food processors and in particular retailers who now squeeze that hourglass and control the flow of food to eaters. At the top of the whole system, the, the company that's really running things right now is Walmart. You know, Walmart captures one out of every four dollars that Americans spend on food. Just staggering. And there are 29 metro areas in the U.S. where Walmart captures half of all the dollars we spend on food. Walmart uh, lately has been on this campaign to change its image. You may have read about some of their sustainability stuff. Um, I've been writing, I just finished a series for Grist online. If, you, if you're interested to read more, kind of picking apart and going through sort of point by point how unsustainable they really are. But what they've been doing, what they've been using that for is in order to win over particularly um, liberal-minded uh, folks in big cities because their next big push is building dozens of stores in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and San Francisco and Washington, D.C. And they're getting more traction on that um, lately than they did when they tried uh, five or six year years ago to do that. So Walmart now is sort of running our, our, a lot of our food system, and you can see the effects of this quite easily. It's very much uh, the effects that you see when you get a monopoly, which is that food prices overall have been going up, Meanwhile, um, the share of our food dollar that makes it to farmers has been going down, and retailers, particularly Walmart, are keeping more and more of it. Um, or we can consider the case of big banks uh, in terms of public policy. In 2007, the top four banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, held assets of $4.5 trillion, which amounted to 37% of all U.S. bank assets, just four banks. Today, they have $6.2 trillion, or 45% of bank assets. So the financial crisis was good for them. <laughs> Meanwhile, of course, community banks didn't get the same sort of bailout. Since 2007, more than 400 community banks have failed. Um, and it wasn't because they were involved, of course, in toxic assets and all that sort of securities trading and all that business, but rather because you know, their customers lost their jobs in the recession and, and fell behind on their, their loan payments and, and public policy really didn't have anything to say about their, about their failure. Or we can look at the case of Amazon.com, which is sort of looming ever larger on the horizon. Um, Amazon has really grown a lot by benefiting from public policy. They, are, uh, they don't have to collect sales tax like independent retailers do. Uh, if you go to a toy store here or a local bookstore, they're going to add almost 10% onto the price of whatever you buy, and they have to by law. Amazon, they don't. They've gotten this great exemption, and it's helped fuel their growth. They also pick up a lot of subsidies. They've built 69 warehouses in the US, and almost all of them have been subsidized in one way or another by local development agencies. You know, go ask a local retailer um, what kind of subsidies they've gotten from the government <laughs> and tell me we have a fair playing field. Um, Amazon is growing so fast right now that if it continues on its current trajectory, it'll be bigger than Walmart by the end of the decade. So when you consider how much the system is rigged against independent businesses, the real wonder is not that so many have failed, but that so many really have survived. And it's a testament, I think, to their resilience, and it's also a resounding uh, rebuttal to the notion long espoused by the titans of our political economy that small and local is inefficient and it's outdated. Um, the empirical evidence shows that in a lot of cases that's not at all true. Big banks, we're often told, for example, have economies of scale. Bigger is better, lower cost for consumers, but it hasn't. The biggest banks charge fees that are 20 to 30 percent higher than local banks and credits, credit unions on average. Mm -hmm. They also pay lower interest rates on our deposits, and they charge higher rates on loans. Banks, if you go look at the economic research, suffer from diseconomies of scale. <coughs> Economists have determined that the optimal size for absolute peak efficiency for a bank is about $5 billion in assets, um, which is about the size of a small regional bank. It's about 450 times smaller than Bank of America and JP Morgan Chase. 
<laughs> not only are big banks inefficient, but they do a really bad job of financing the real economy. Um, just to share a little bit of a statistic on that, if you put all the small and mid-sized banks in the country together, they hold about 25% of all of the bank assets. Mm -hmm. And they do 60% of all the small business lending in this country. The reverse is true for the top 20 banks. They have 60% of all the assets, but they do only 25% of small business lending. It would take me a little too long to explain by why exactly that is, but the, the, the upshot is that big banks aren't very good at small business lending because they don't have a lot of local knowledge. And so they don't make a very good choices about loans and they get a lot of defaults on their small business lending because they don't really understand the local economies where they're lending. And so they just don't make very many of those loans. Um, the credit crunch that small businesses are facing is going to continue after the recession unless we downsize the scale of our banking industry to better meet the needs of the local economy. And we could go on. There are all kinds of sectors where we know small is better. We know that small farms have the largest yields per acre with the least amount of environmental impact. We know that independent bookstores um, sell a much more diverse, a wide-ranging uh, selection of books than Amazon does. We know that independent pharmacies um, provide better health care at lower cost than, um, than chains do and mail-order pharmacies. Consumer Reports has consistently found this in the surveys it does. A couple of weeks ago, there was a study in Oregon that found that more than half of pharmacists who work for chains like Walgreens and Walmart said that their working conditions were so bad that they it created a situation uh, where they were, were very likely to make serious and potentially hazardous <coughs> mistakes. In contrast, only 8% of pharmacists at local pharmacies said their working conditions undermined a safe and effective care. There's a very interesting experiment um, underway in North Dakota. Um, North Dakota is such an interesting state. <laughs> I think that they're so temperamentally conservative that they are sort of free to do things that, that make a lot of common sense, but maybe other states would, would sort of shy away from because they sound radical to some people. Fifty years ago, um, North Dakota adopted a law that bars corporations from owning pharmacies. So there are no chain pharmacies. There are no pharmacies and supermarkets and Walmart stores in North Dakota. Um, and what's interesting, they're all independent, and if you look at the state, and, and we did a study on this at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, North Dakota has far more drug stores per capita. They're in really tiny towns, rural areas that in other regions of the country don't have pharmacies. They've got them in North Dakota. Um, they score better on all these measures of like health care uh, provision through pharmacies, um, and their drug costs are lower than everybody else's. So bigger is not necessarily um, better. And we know, of course, um, that, that beyond sort of the effectiveness of local uh, enterprises, they're also compatible with democracy. They nourish our local economies and create more prosperity than big businesses. They promote social and civic engagement, and they're more environmentally sustainable and adaptable. There are um, many signs right now, as I suggested at the beginning, that Americans are really quite eager right now to have a conversation about scale and ownership and about the structure of our economy. And that Americans are really quite eager to act on that. You know, more and more people are moving their money. Um, research that we do and, and other uh, people have done shows that more uh, people have buy local on their minds when they're making decisions in the marketplace. But all of these things, I think, um, we have to take as indicators of people's interests. These things are not change. Moving your, moving your money is good, but it's not change. And I very much agree with what Annie Leonard had to say um, this morning, that we can't just act as consumers, we also have to act as citizens, that that is really how it is that we make change. Um, at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we have been working on calling for new rules and working with communities across the country uh, on implementing a new set of policies. Um, we maintain a library on our site of, of policies uh, across the economic spe spectrum, many of them actual rules that have been, been adopted in one place or another, like North Dakota, um, that can be good models for other states. And a lot of what we're doing um, is working at the local and the state level, because it is a little daunting to think about how do you change Congress, you know? And I think our minds, when we think about political change, we kind of go to Congress. But the reality is that we all have a lot of power when it comes to changing what our city council does, what our state legislatures do. And our states and our cities have a lot of dormant authority to exercise that they haven't been exercising over the economy. 
Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in the workshop later today about what some of these kinds of policy levers are. But to just give you a flavor, you know, states, uh, many states have deposit caps that prevent any one bank from having more than a certain percentage of the deposits in a state. In many cases, these caps are way too high and they have various kinds of loopholes. But a state would have the authority to say, you know, no bank can have more than 1% of all the deposits in our state. So instead of having to knock on Congress's door, why don't we knock on the door of our state legislatures? States also have a lot of dormant antitrust authority that they don't exercise. They've kind of left it to the Department of Justice, and we could do a lot more there. At the local level, there's a tremendous amount of power that we have over land use law, economic development policy that can really shape how sustainable our communities are and the degree to which our communities are places where local enterprise can prosper and, and build the kind of economy uh, that we need. And lastly, I'll just say that um, you know the other piece that we're really working on and working in partnership with the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, the American Independent Business Alliance, is how do you engage all these small business owners to be the constituency for this change? Because they're very powerful, potentially, right? If we could organize and bring that voice. Um, and it's their livelihoods that are at stake in this debate. So it's enormously, uh, the potential for them to really speak out is, uh, is incredible. But you know, until recently, the only entities speaking for small business were the Chambers of Commerce, you know, which are really big business, of course. The National Federation of Independent Business, again, another sort of ideologically based business group that really doesn't represent uh, small businesses. So we've been working a lot on how do you engage them uh, to bring about uh, the kind of change that we need. Thank you so much.